And so I'd like to introduce to you Christina Hoffner. Um, for many people here, there's no introduction needed, but if you haven't met Christina before, she works for Catalyst, and she's been um, one of the key people in New Zealand involved in the development and promotion of e-portfolios, both across the school sector and also the tertiary sector. And she is uh, she travels widely, uh, including East Cape recently. So there you go, from the outer outer wilds of East Cape, she's come back to us, and uh, having been refreshed by her holiday there. And so she's going to talk to us today about duration and equal values. Thanks, Christine. Yeah, Stephen. Thank you. And yes, I did survive the rain up there. Um, it's much nicer in Wellington this year around, and so I'm very grateful that we also have fantastic weather here in Auckland today um, to kick off uh, Sotel with the first ever symposium. So thank you also very much that I co um, to the organizing committee that I can present today. And um, yes, as Stephen said, curate learning through ePortfolios. So of course the first question is who in the room has already been working with ePortfolios? The vast majority, that is fantastic to see. Um, we do have a session tomorrow, shortly after 12, right before lunch, where we are going to look at um, examples from people where you can share your portfolio practices and get together with other educators to look into them and um, have a bit of an experience um, exchange. What we're doing here this morning, though, is briefly look at what curation can mean in the, in the world of ePortfolios and also how that can look like um, taking some examples. And then I'll guide you through one of the metaphors um, that are being used in the ePortfolio world to explain portfolios to students or also to others in order to make it more tangible. Because portfolio, the word itself, um, is, has been around for many, many years, actually also centuries, and of course has a lot of meaning behind it and different people understand different things with it and therefore it can be quite difficult initially to let students know what you're actually meaning in education for it and so using a metaphor might make it a bit easier and also a more fun way to explain it rather than trying to use uh, dry terms there. Um, the curation of learning through portfolios is important because e-portfolios aren't just archives. So a lot of times when we see portfo um, portfolios created in education, they contain all the evidence uh, because students, oh, sorry, because students create learning evidence and they also collect it but that's not where the buck stops with an e-portfolio. That's kind of where the e-portfolio begins to become really interesting. Namely, once we have all the evidence uh, created and collected, we then need to organize and also actually curate to really make meaning of it, because otherwise it's just an archive. But we can only really learn from it when we review things, when we reflect on the learning evidence, <coughs> when we reflect on what we have done, but also not just reflect on it on our own, but also with others in the room. So all these four activities, I find, form part of the portfolio practice, namely, first, of course, creation of evidence, finding what you would like to reflect on, what you'd like to collect, put together, in order to show what has been learned, and then also the curation around it, to make sense of it by reflecting on it, by interpreting it, by pulling other people into it as well, and getting other opinions in there through feedback, through comments, sometimes also co-creation and co-reflecting um, and collecting. And all that, if you're kind of looking at a term, because we do like terms and methodologies in education, can be a bit um, summarized as folio thinking. And that has been popularized by um, Helen Chen. She is an um, expert in e-portfolios and uh, working at Stanford University. And uh, Vicky Suter has a website, and I will make the slides available for you. And um, her name is then linked to her blog post. And so she says, full your thinking is an approach of engaging the collection, 
organization, reflection, and connection, that leads to a person's ability to speak intelligently and concisely about one's learning experiences, what they mean and their value, and how the experiences relate to one another. And essentially, one could also say it is telling stories. We are not just presenting facts, but we are telling stories about ourselves. The journey we have been to the point where our portfolio is being shown and what we have done until then and um, where we are at. It is storytelling. So I'll show you a couple of examples. And the first one is from a design student at the University of the Arts London. Just waiting until the picture has been taken. <laughs> and that is a typical portfolio. Um, it does contain evidence. You can see pictures taken of the f actual physical evidence because when we are working on an electronic portfolio, we do have the possibilities of bringing images, audio, and video in much more than in a paper-based one. But uh, unfortunately, we still cannot really make the physical objects tangible, so we always need representations of them. And then in the middle of that um, portfolio, you, the, the student reflected on it. The student summarized what they're showing and from that, we can gather why they show those particular images in this case. Because they have been selected for a particular reason in order to make an argument. In this case, it is sometimes from the language the student uses, not, they are not saying, I reflect on and I reviewed, but it's everything a bit more implicitly mentioned. Whereas in this next example, um, that is a Seamalt portfolio from Teresa McKinnon at the University of Warwick. CMOD stands for Certified Member of the Association of Learning Technologists. That's probably a certificate um, that a number of you here in the room also have or um, are working towards to. Is that she, of course, as educator, uses some of the meta language. So she specifically mentions curation. She curates resources online via Scoopit and other um, tools. And as we've seen, uh, portfolio is oftentimes <coughs> also involved with sharing with others, so she is eager to share her experiences, eager to share what she has learned and engage in conversations. And she also regularly reviews and evaluates what she has done. And that is very important in the process of um, working with portfolios and engaging in that practice, because through that reflection, through that review and evaluation, um, do we improve the learning? And can we actually see what have we done in the meantime? Do we have improved and how can we also help others? And so in that entire spirit, this um, CMOD portfolio was created in, created in 2013. Um, last year she had a review and reflected on her application from a few years ago and what she has done in the meantime. And there again, it comes out as the point at which I realized. So really thinking back, taking the time to review and to reflect on her teaching and learning and on her approach to teaching as well. I revisited through the feedback and mentoring, I received helpful um, tips and a highlight. And the highlight is also important for the portfolio work and that's what the term curation also entails. It is not just dumping everything into the portfolio and just having everything there and then just showing it to an instructor or to an evaluator. No, it is the selection that is really, really important. It is finding the most pertinent pieces of evidence that tell the story best. Because they're short, lots of things that contribute to something, but they're usually certain pieces of evidence that illustrate it really, really well. And those are the things that should go into a portfolio. So those are the uh, examples, just very briefly, to see that portfolios are curated collections of evidence that also engage people. But that doesn't come from its own. No student is born to create portfolios well, and therefore we do need support. And that is a quote from Einan and Gambino from the book High Impact Practices in ePortfolios. The process of curating the connected collection, making meaning through reflection and thereby developing deeper, more intentional identities as learners, 
requires thoughtful student action guided by well-informed faculty and staff and supported by a broad coalition of college stakeholders. So again, and here we have the collection of the evidence. Through the reflection, we get deeper, have deeper understanding from the students, but they do need to be supported by the entire faculty, and that means by you guys here in the room because you also need to understand how portfolios work and how you can work best with them with your students um, so that they also fit into the curriculum, that they are aligned with what you're teaching. And that is where it's, portfolios shouldn't just be add-on activities, but they should really be integrated and um, in order to bring the full your thinking approach across. And so just a very short video. Um, this is a compilation of tips from um, Teresa McKinnon as well. Um, they use portfolios for assessment at the University of Warwick and over the few years they've gathered some important things that should be in portfolios for the students. And while her examples are from Mahara, um, it applies the same to other uh, portfolio systems that you might use at your own institutions and work with because it is not so much about the tool that is being used, but rather the pedagogy behind it. So using the illustration with images and video rather than just text is important um, everywhere and also clearly communicating the learning process is important no matter the software that is being used. And they do encourage their students quite a bit to work with rituals in order to tell their stories. And Teresa works primarily in language education and that's why her examples are in different languages as well. And why they use portfolios in their for showcasing <coughs> for purposes when you create a different portfolio, assessment portfolio, or also developmental portfolio, you will still showcase your skills and what you have learned. And so that takes kind of looking at the support side. We saw a few tips, and that also means we need tailored activities for the students, also to scaffold the learning, in particular when they get started with portfolios. And a curated portfolio does not negate that, in my opinion, um, because um, the templates that can be created are only stepping stones. Here's an example from the Defense Academy at Cranfield University in the United Kingdom. Um, there, Sam Taylor and Orly Solier and um, another colleague of theirs have been working for a number of years with portfolios supporting soldiers and other army personnel in their learning journeys. And so one integral part has been a portfolio module for them. And what they do is they provide a guidance for the students because they only see them for a week, maximum two weeks. So it's a very short period of time in which they need to do a lot of stuff. And so they have um, guiding questions there. This is from a new module that they've created in organizational development. They also work with groups with students so that students create um, portfolios collaboratively. But again, you can see their guidance in there. They have instructions in the individual section so that the students know what needs to be done, what they need to collect. However, that does not mean that it is entirely prescribed. Students can still decide how they want to collect and showcase their work. Is it a short video? Is it an audio narration? Is it a blog post? It is left up to them. They can also rearrange the pages to make them fit their own personality more, to personalize their portfolios um, and not necessarily follow that structure. These instructions are only there to give the students something to hold on to when they start with portfolios so that because it is an assessed portfolio, they need to make sure that they kind of hit all the marks there, but they can still um, bring in themselves their group work because they also come from different cultures and therefore make the portfolio their own. And reflection is a big part of that. 
Um, sometimes in their case, due to the way the study programs are structured, the reflection doesn't necessarily happen on each module, but it happens in a wider context. So the reflection is sometimes also in their case outside of the portfolio, but it is still an integral part of their entire learning. And so now, how can we actually bring across that aspect of curation to students and make it interesting for them to actually explore? Well, we could use a metaphor. And Mandy Mentes from Massey University, um, she came or she came up with the metaphor of an art gallery a few years ago and has been using that successfully with her students and explaining what is the portfolio and what can they do with it. And so we've kind of reimagined this a little bit because we are going to put that also into the user manual for Mahara. And we, we call it a museum. It's not one of these old stuffy European museums, but it is a living museum. It is a museum with bright windows, open spaces, lots of interactive displays, and lots of things to do. And so if we take a look at this picture, we start at the bottom in the basement. This is the collection part. This is where the curator has all the things, where they store everything, no matter what. You can also, if you've ever been in Tipapa, think about Tipapa. What we see on top floors is fine, but underneath there's actually long hallways of archives. So you have everything down there. And then when a curator decides to put a collection together, a collection, like a portfolio, we have everything and then we collect things, we curate it and we decide what actually goes upstairs. And so one exhibition might be around um, ancient cultural items, but we are not putting everything on there because we are focusing on a particular time period. And so there are certain elements there. Then in another collection, we might also have interactive displays, again, one room on its own that follows a particular theme, and so on. That's how you go through the museum, because you never ever see everything that a museum has on one period of time or on one topic. We only ever see a selection, because that's where the curator comes in, why they have their job, because they make sense of what is being shown in the gallery. Thank you, Zine. And But it's not just putting stuff onto the wall or onto pedestals. It is also curating it and explaining to visitors what you actually see. Because there are always text notices, they are kind of putting things into context and making sure that we understand why the things are on the wall and how that can, uh, comes about. And that's what we do on portfolios too. And what we also do is, sometimes we have an open portfolio that everybody can look at, um, no matter um, of how much money they have, everybody can just go in. But certain exhibits might actually be closed off to the public. Um, and we can do that with portfolios as well because not everything can be public if we are talking um, about mentoring sessions or if um, students are involved in teaching sessions. So sometimes you really only want to share that with an assessor or with a particular group of people and not everybody. And that's why I think the metaphor of a museum can kind of fit nicely to explain portfolio work to students because we have everything in a basement um, can collect everything, but never ever show everything altogether, and then can also decide with whom we want to share things, and also how we want to share it and bring the context into place in order to make sense of the artifacts that are shown. Because the viewer needs to know why they are seeing things, um, how it fits together. Because I can't just have a Rembrandt sitting next to a Picasso and know immediately where the connection is. Because then, sure, I can make up my own mind, um, but I might draw completely different um, conclusions than what the curator might actually want to bring across. Yeah, and that's kind of one idea of a metaphor. Um, we have a couple of minutes left. If you kind of feel like this is not the metaphor to explain it and you have a different idea, or have already ex um, 
created your own metaphor that you've been employing successfully with students or staff. We have a couple of minutes time to talk about these as well. Thank you. So obviously the metaphor of an art gallery or a museum leads, leads naturally to the idea of curation because when you say what does a curator do, most people immediately make that connection between art gallery or museum and the term curator. But has anybody got any other ideas about the kind of metaphor that they might use or might be? Alison. Um, we use, oh, I can't claim credit for it, the Trove University in Education, they came up with using the metaphor of a wardrobe. And specific, what they were particularly focusing on is that um, you might actually have multiple portfolios and each one has to be appropriate to the audience that you're creating it for. And so the idea that as you go over time, you collect lots of pieces of clothing of all kinds, which you have in your wardrobe, and if you are going for an interview, for example, you go to your wardrobe and you choose clothing that is appropriate to that interview. And that it tells, the, it gives the impression that you want to give to the interviewer, tells the story through your appearance that you want to give. Um, and so you select the pieces that are appropriate. And it's like that with a portfolio. You know, your, your wardrobe is your portfolio with all your pieces of evidence. And when you are creating a specific presentation for a particular purpose, you choose those bits that tell, present you in the way that you would like to be presented. And that's quite a nice. It doesn't have all of the labelling and everything, which I think is really important too, but it's, it's for a slightly different perspective, mm -hmm. I suppose. Yeah. That's a really nice one. Yeah. Um, we use a whole new, and obviously we might that recently well. What people don't really understand is their whole photo is not just about what's inside, it's also about what's outside. But when you look at the Aramaka and Amai, which is more in depth than what their photo really is about, there are just different positionings of things within their photo. It's just not the carvings that are up in the wall. And there are different um, traditions that happen in different parts. So, yeah, and that was. We've also asked on um, Facebook and in other groups of what other metaphors people use. And um, actually at the last Mahara user group meeting, uh, Tabitha from Waitemata DHB shared uh, the metaphor of a performance. Um, again, it doesn't have all the labeling there, but for performance you also pull things together. <coughs> you go into kind of the backstage area and you decide what you want to get from there and pull to the front in order to use for the performance. Um, and therefore also select um, based on the audience, um, based on the occasion, and can therefore uh, work with that. Or some people also use a fridge metaphor, which is very similar to the wardrobe. Um, one where you also organize things and then pull things out to make a meal, and um, therefore select. And the important thing there that we always have is it's the selection. So we can have really, really big wardrobe, but of course on a day-to-day -day basis, we can only wear so much and can only select certain things that kind of fit. Okay, so the other part about the mm -hmm. metaphor I think that's really important is often uh, when you introduce portfolios, people think straight away that they're going to use it with their final year students because that's when they're about to go out for a job. And so then we say, well, the problem is if you start in their final year, their wardrobe's got very little in it. And so either they have to go and do a whole lot of shopping all at once to fill their wardrobe so that they've got evidence, or they have to go with very little evidence and try and create a portfolio from nothing very much. Mm -hmm. And so it's a way of getting people to think about you really need to get them to start adding to their wardrobe from the moment they begin their program, even though they might not use a whole lot of that evidence till their third year. Mm -hmm. I think that's another really important part of it, and that's where that metaphor can really help people to understand that idea. And I think the wardrobe also helps, kind of Simpson and works also with the museum, but for the wardrobe you, you're not always collecting things only, but at some point, maybe once a year, you go also through and throw them yourself. Yeah, true. And kind of take them somewhere else. Yeah. So you already curate the entire bigger collection, and then you make another smaller collection, 
uh, collecting in order to show things. So kind of working with these metaphors, I think, really helps it to make it easier for people to understand what is actually happening. Stephen? So, so can you see a future where um, now that uh, children in primary school are quite electronic and online, um, collections would be started much earlier in life and not just, uh, you know, tertiary level? Um, it's certainly already been happening. Uh, I mean, um, Minnesota has had a e-portfolio initiative a few years ago where it was a statewide portfolio that um, everybody could connect to. And here in New Zealand, um, we do have my portfolio, which was initially only started for tertiaries, but then the high schools kind of said, well, in order to pre prepare our students for tertiary, they should already start portfolios then in order to kind of take that with them, have that showcase when they enter university. And then of course the, the middle schools took it and kind of it went all the way back to primary schools so that we do have two of my portfolios in New Zealand, one for the compulsory sector and then one for tertiary, so that a portfolio can be kept over a period of time. Mm. Yeah. Well, schools yeah. develop their own as well. Oh. So yeah. Yeah, I, I went with the ECE uh, and Edwin Tech was part, part of my job in uh, is EDUCAT, which is a New Zealand designed portfolio system for um, zero to five years, yeah. and Story Park, which is the American yeah. kind of model that a lot of centres use. And there's, I don't know what the percentage of ECU centres that use um, e portfolios, but it's growing, and it's probably the majority have a e-portfolio mm. but the, the teachers have quite a role in it, you know in taking the photos and uploading it to the child's portfolio rather than the children mm. I see so well. yeah. but yeah. the early childhood um, um, sector as well the, the audiences are different mm. and often it's mm. opening the audience out so it's mm. about the partnership between Fano and and the centre and mm -hmm. children in the centre. So um, you get a lot of feedback. I used to work for ERO and we were in reviewing and we talked sometimes about the impact that this had had. And it had um, deprivatised a lot of the stuff that they used to do portfolios for children <coughs> and the parents looked at them and now and again and there was a bit of discussion. Now these e portfolios are available internationally so the grandparents and extended family mm -hmm. can participate in that child's experience. Mm -hmm. So it's been quite. Um, it was a feedback, isn't it? That the, yeah. the kids get the can be a spoken feedback or a webcam oh. feedback or a, you know type feedback. Oh. Mm -hmm. Natalie, you had a question. I think the challenging thing I found about starting with people following is the store or the bottom uh, floor here just gets really really huge, mm -hmm. and I think about it like the kids toy box, and I want I want that set, I want something. Because I've got too much in there. And I think that's where something where you can kind of group and tag assets. Uh, learning about that right at the beginning is a really good thing because if the box gets full, I can't find anything. Yeah. I can't remember what I called it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I think that was a challenging thing I found when I started. Yeah. But, but by being able to group them like on shelves or something like that with tags, yeah. it helped a lot. Or if you're using the word for metaphor, kind of make yeah. a decision early on whether you go according to seasons, <laughs> yeah. or yeah. according to yeah. colors, yeah. or short and long yeah. and some, yeah. yeah. and, and really get started with the organization yeah. um, relatively quickly on whichever way is possible in the portfolio system that you're using mm -hmm. in order to find stuff more, more easily. And of course, full text search these days makes that much easier yeah. already um, by having a good organization. So we sort of have to teach us. Yeah. And I think there's other parts to the whole curation process as well, like we haven't really talked very much about the whole quality assurance side of it, but when they collect things, I guess it's implied in curation that they are looking for particular criteria mm -hmm. for the items, yes. so that they've got a, quality, a set of quality criteria mm -hmm. that they're looking to fulfil. And they're not just kind of collecting, you know, it's not just a, a task like, okay, give me 10 websites about maths education. There's actually some quality criteria built into it as well. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and that's where the instructions for the acti portfolio activities can help, um, or also working with trip breaks, so that it is transparent for students to, to know kind of what they should be collecting. Because again, not everything needs to be collected, but it should also be presented. Um, but maybe last question. Last question. Yeah. Oh, no, it was coming. Oh, um, coming. I was a teacher and parent at International School and Service, so um, our school uses e-portfolios across the world from early childhood right to the top of high school. Um, as a parent, I really enjoyed that engagement with my mm -hmm. kids' learning, but also the ownership they had over their learning as well, so they were able to showcase things to me rather than I'd have to dig it out of them. They would just say, hey, look at it. And to build confidence, you know, they learn how to speak into a, um, for a video or something and actually tell me, pull about what they've done. In middle school, it was much more private, but they don't want us to look. And we don't, we don't like to share it with the parents. They're like, don't send this to our parents. But um, they were still able to have that sort of pulling apart of, of their learning, so it really worked well for them. But as a parent or someone on looking at it, it's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think we're out of time now, but I'd like you all to show your appreciation.